All right, Eugene. Yes. Eugene, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I'm from Seaside, California. Tell me about your family. Um, well, I have, uh, at the time, three sisters, two older, one younger, and myself. And then along uh, during my incarceration, my mom had a little boy, which is my little brother, Junior, who died in a house fire with two of my nephews in January of 2015. I'm sorry. Yeah. How would you describe your childhood? I would describe my childhood as rocky. Um, you know, not having any brothers to look up to, you know, my I was like ostracized because, you know, I'm a boy, so I didn't do what the girls did, what my sisters did. Was your dad around? Not, not constantly. I knew his face, knew who he was, knew where he lived, but it were my uncles, my mom's brothers who were, who were around more often than not. And I don't recall them ever being out of prison or YA or the boys' ranch all at one time. It was always, you know, it was almost like they rotated in and out of my life. In so the, in the prison, right? Prison, boys' ranch, whatever, and wherever they were at at the age they were at. Yeah, you know, boys' ranch is the prison for teenagers. Right. Basically. Right. Under eighteen. So I was in a. Everything that I was taught, I was taught by them. As far as you know, being slick, lick a sucker, don't be no punk, don't be weak. You know, um, hiding 20 gauges under my mattress, don't tell your mom, those type of things, you know, just things that I kind of idolized. I was like, okay, this is, this, is, this is what a boy is supposed to do. This is a boy following me, and this is how I'm supposed to uh, live my life. These are the things I'm supposed to look forward to. Those are your role, role models. Absolutely. Hmm. And you got yourself in trouble eventually, I, huh? I got myself in trouble, but yeah, yes, I did, yeah. What age, what age did that start? That started at, I think I was about 13 when I got arrested the first time for stealing a bike. Crazy thing, right? Because I was such a good kid. I wasn't really in the, I didn't know nothing about stealing and all that. I ended up going to a group home when I was, when I was young. And in that group home, we met a family, uh, siblings. They were all girls, though, my sister's age, you know. So we ended up hanging out with them, going to the swim center, and they were stealing at a 7-Eleven, first time I stole something, I had so many packages of now laters around my socks. Cause I was like, well, this is what it is. Like, okay, that's cool. Let me let me get as much candy as I can get. Cause I don't want to ask nobody for no candy. So, you know, I, I remember I stuffed now laters around my socks, both of my legs. And as I was walking out the store, the lady was just standing there waiting for me. She was like, can you come here? I was like, what? She was like, you still? I was like, no, I didn't. And she just started pulling up my pants leg. And I was like, you know, it was embarrassing. But at the same time, because of the things that I was being taught is it's OK to steal if you don't get caught. I got caught because I did something wrong. So then in turn, I had to figure out, OK, how can I be slicker? What do I need to do next time so I don't get caught? That mentality, you know? So it, they, it went from that, from the, again, from the now laters to stealing a, a bike. And I stole the bike because my mom bought me a bike. Granted, it wasn't a brand new bike, but it was a nice little red mongoose bike. Somebody stole my bike three days later. Can you imagine that? Like I was, I think I was about 11 years old and somebody stole my bike. Man, I was hurt. So I was like, you know, when I find me a bike, I'm gonna steal me a bike, you know? And, and that's what I did. I ended up going to juvenile hall for, I don't know, I think it was like three days. But damn, them three days seemed like forever. They did, it seemed like forever. And then everybody was in there was just like rowdy and turned up, you know, like active, like, like they wanted to fight. Like they was just full of this energy, this untamed energy, you know what I mean? And looking back, that's what it was. It was this untamed energy just bouncing off the walls, doing whatever they wanted to do. And I was afraid, I was scared. I was like, damn, this, this is what it's like. But then, you know, uh, again, having these uncles, these role models in and out of my life, you know, punching on me, making me tough, stop crying, you know, things like that. You know, those are the things that, that started to shape my reality, you know, and, and again, um, created this character, you know, this, this 
just character that, you know, uh, I can take what I want. It's all good as long as I don't get caught. You know what I mean? Uh, I could be who I want. Who going to stop me? So, yeah, man, just, you know, having a troubled childhood, man. I remember talking to my cousin. He's from Oakland, the Bay Area. And I remember one time he came to stay with us and we was outside and I was like, man, what's wrong with your shoes? You got holes in your shoes. And this is how far I've gotten, right? This is how far I've gotten in my criminal thinking, my way of thinking. Man, you got holes in your shoes. He was like, no, I was like, come on, let's go. Man, we went down there. Yeah, we went to Kmart. Absolutely. Kmart, yeah. We went to Kmart. And I was like, here, put these on. It's like, how them feel? He was like, they feel good. I was like, let's go. And we walked out. You know, so I tainted his life. You know what I mean? Because my life was tainted not knowing no better. We ain't got it. We finna find a way to go get it. You, you think you had a dad who maybe wasn't you know, running the streets that might have changed your your life? If my father was present. If your dad was in your life every day. Uh, at the time, my father was addicted to drugs. So I think, honestly, looking back, I think I would have sold more drugs, honestly. I, I think at that time. No, but but if, you, if your dad, if you had a different dad who was not a, a if, if my father, before he was addicted to drugs, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I would have had a different life because, That's and the, I mean. the strangest thing to say is, you know, and the most honest thing to say is there was there were there was really only two things I ever really wanted to do when I was young. I'm talking about 12, 13, 14, 15. There was only two things I wanted to do, and that was play football and take karate. That was it. But I couldn't do it. The finances weren't right. Father was absent, made a million and one promises. But yeah, you know, uh, that's life, man. You know, I had to I had to grow out of that, you know, but I didn't grow out of that no time soon it took even during my my young years of uh like I, I i the last time prior to me going to committing the offense of going to prison and spending 26 years eight months in prison for a um, home invasion murder robbery i uh i stole a car nice car too it was one of it was a it was a this was a 1990 and it was a 1989 Ford Escort, brand new, right off the lot. And uh, man, my my homie was driving. He almost ran a dude over, so the police pulled us over. You know, I wasn't driving. My homie was driving. They pulled us out to cuff us up. I ended up running. I got away, but then somehow, some way, I was in the kitchen drinking a glass of milk, and it was almost like a milk commercial. I heard the female police, I'm standing in the window drinking, because I used to drink milk and sugar, you know? I don't know why, but I liked the taste. It was like like a cold milkshake to me, because I'd make it, put some sugar in it, and put it in the freezer. So when I got home, at whatever point in time I did, it would be right there, just delicious. So I remember being home, and I was so thirsty because I, I had ran from the police. I mean, like, literally miles and got away, backtracking. I hear him on the radio, hear the car screeching and everything. And um, I remember getting in the house and I'm drinking my milk over the sink because I'm so thirsty. I don't want it to spill, dribble down all onto the floor and everything. So I'm leaning over the sink and our kitchen window, boom, is wide open. Not as, as far as the window, but the curtains were open. And I just see this lady, I see her head peep up and she says, I see him, he's in the kitchen drinking milk. And, and to this day, it just reminds me like, man, that would be a very cold milk commercial right there, you know? But then, yeah, so I, I knew at that point that, that I, I was caught, man. So I ended up going upstairs telling my mom what happened. You know, she was like, all right, I'm finna put you on the bus. I was like, police outside, it ain't even gonna matter, you know? So I ended up going to the boys ranch, didn't do too good up in there. Ended up getting into a couple of fights. You know, uh, I was all right, though. I was all right until one of my childhood friends showed up, you know, and, and I'm just relaxing. And somebody comes up to the to the uh, uh, not the dorm, but it was like cabins. It was in Shasta. And um, they come up to me. Hey, man, your, your homie's out there fighting. So I go outside. That's a big dude. He, you know, he pushed the big dude to me like, hey, man, don't don't bump into me no more. You see, you know what it was. You know what I mean? So he pushed him into me again. And, you know. I knocked him out. Um, 
crazy. I, I, that that added to my alter ego, though, because, you know, I'm a righty and I knocked him out with my left. And it's like, ooh, I'm feeling like, ooh, I anybody can get the business. I was fighting grown men at 16, 17, grown men thinking that, you know what, I'm a minor. So if we was to get caught, I wouldn't be the one to go to jail. Wrong. Because I ended up getting into a fight with an adult male, pulled over, we throw hands, and I end up getting arrested and going to juvie. So I'm saying all that to say, like, that just created and added on to that monster, you know, that, that alter ego. I ended up spending, I don't know, like nine months in juvenile hall and, and then going out to the, to the boys' ranch. And then I ended up getting kicked out of the boys' ranch because of the fighting. And then I ended up becoming a, a ward of the state. My mom ended up telling them, hey, we're going to New Orleans. I'm going to take my son to New Orleans. And I did. I ended up going to New Orleans for a while, but I ended up coming right back, homesick. And uh, I started doing music. And so my auntie, she had a music connection out, in, out here in LA. So I came down, did a show for the record producers. They was like, oh yeah, we like you, we like you. We're going to get in contact with you. I waited, it was like it went about, about two weeks, but them two weeks seemed like forever. No word, nothing. I ended up getting a call from a friend. Hey man, I, I got a lick. I'm like, what you talking about? Cause he been doing licks, it's supposed to be all good. So we ended up going to do a lick and that's the lick that ended up changing my life forever. So I tell him, well, what's, what's, what's in the lick? How much is it? How much we gonna get? He was like, well, it's about 50,000 up in there. You're going to get 15. All you got to do is just make sure don't nobody pull up, don't nobody come around. What? Say less. I'm, I'm with that. Like, I'm with that. Ain't nobody supposed to be home either. He ran down the whole script to me. I, you know, and I trusted him because why? Because he's been successful. This is what he does. You know what I mean? This is what he does. It's never been my thing. And uh, when I got older, my uncle told me, like, you know, Stealing, you above that. I'm above stealing. So I thought like, you know, jacking and robbing, that was something a little different, you know? So anyway, I ended up going on this lit robbery. Uh, people started calling it flocking when I was in prison. Uh, with, with three other people, three other men and a female who was a getaway driver. She's uh, deceased now due to COVID, unfortunately. Uh, but we ended up going into this house. Um, it was like two in the morning. We ended up going into this house, lurking around. The garage door was open. So that just made it a little more easier. It made me feel a little more comfortable about the fact that he know what he's talking about. You know, uh, once we get in there, one of my co-defendants reach over, takes the phone off the hook, the phone blurps. I'm like, we all looking like, what the hell are you doing? Anyway, boom, this is when we find out somebody's in the house. Somebody, a lady calls out to her daughter. Such and such, is that you? Nothing. It's on. Like this, this it, 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 I believe the reports, the police reports said it lasted 45 minutes. It felt like it was a whole day. It felt like it was a whole day. It was nothing that I've ever done before. Um, during the commission of this, of this uh, home invasion, um, I stayed in the front of the house, you know, keeping an eye out, making sure nobody came. My co-defendants went to the back, um, allegedly, as I would say, because I wasn't there. So allegedly, according to police reports and according to what I've been told, um, you know, one of my co-defendants took the daughter out of the room who the, the mother was calling out for. Two of my other co-defendants went into the master bedroom, put both of the parents on the floor. Man and woman demanded to know where the safe was. The gentleman kept saying he didn't know where the safe was. Allegedly, my co-defendant, one of them had, his, had their foot on, on the, the wife's back, the mother of the daughter. And the other one was dragging the other, the parent around the house, the father. Um, during that time, he ended up in that closet and called me, hey, come here. Like, what's good? What's happening? What's going, what's, where, where the money at? You know, because that's what I was there for. Wasn't there to hurt nobody, see nobody. Wasn't nobody who was supposed to be there.
Had I thought, had I known somebody was going to be there, I wouldn't have went. In hindsight, if I had to do it all over again, at that age, I would have done it because of my thinking. But with the knowledge and understanding that I have today, I would not have done it. So moving forward, one of my co-defendants allegedly started to threaten to kill the, um, the daughter. You know, he sexually assaulted her with the shotgun, said he was going to blow her head off. The, the father stood up, went to do what he was supposed to do. I respect it wholeheartedly. This man also became my hero for, for reasons that some people may not even be able to conceive. But when you walk through the fire and you sit in the fire and you become a changed person inside and out, then you start to understand. So this man was, he was a father. He was a father. He was protecting his family. So in the midst of him getting up to protect his family, one of my other co-defendants went over there to try to help this guy who had the shotgun to get him into a safe zone, so to speak, because he was having problems with the father. He was having problems, struggling over the gun. So allegedly, my co-defendant went over there, I believe struck him in the back of the head, didn't do nothing, then pushed him down. And as he fell, as they all fell to the ground, the gun went off. It shot him in his lower back, severed his spine, and he died. I ended up, we ended up fleeing the residence. My co-defendant, the female, the driver, she left us. So we're running through weeds, yay high, sticks and everything, like pokey sticks, you know them sticks that poke you. We're running through all kind of madness, like in the dark. No, I ain't never been out there before in my life. I don't know where we going, but I know that we running down this road. That's kind of like, you know, you see the, you see the side road going this way. So we just running through the forest, through the trees, through the swamp. And it was swamp. Uh, man, it was it was a it was a crazy chain of events. Just everything that happened that night because it happened so fast, but then it happened so slow because it's like time slowed down. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, man, to recall is like the adrenaline was was pumping in me so fast and so hard that man, I'm in pitch dark. We're jumping over barbed wire fences like. Getting out because we can hear the police going by, see them shining the lights. And our whole thing is just get away. It took us, I don't know, maybe looking back, probably it was about a mile to get to my Cody Phoenix house. Got over there. That was crazy. Why? Because her father was a, uh, a corrections officer. So my friend dated, that was his girl. So anyway... While we're in the house, two of my co-defendants are in the bathroom because they hear him come in. So they go step in the bathroom. I'm sitting on the chair. My other co-defendant sitting on the bed. His girl just standing up trying to figure out why her father's coming into the room. Of course he's coming in the room because he hear a whole bunch of noise. What noise does he hear? Well, he hears one of my co-defendants banging on the door because he was too slow to keep up. Hmm, ironic, right? So... When he comes in the house, he's making all this noise, breathing heavy, asking, why y'all leave me? Why y'all leave me? It was like, every man for himself, what do you mean? You know what I mean? Like, things transpired that should not even, even have transpired. So it's like, do what you do. Get to where you got to get to. Anyway, uh, her father came in. He like, hey, what's going on? Like, oh, I ain't nothing much, this and this and that. And then you hear a boom. What's the boom? The boom is the two co-defendants that went into the bathroom. One of them tried to sit the shotgun up on the bathtub. It fell, boom, into the bathtub, make, causing that noise. So then he's like, oh, what the hell? He going there a little, oh, what the hell? Y'all get up out of my house. Y'all need to get out of my house. So then a few hours later, I guess the detectives started making their rounds, knocking on doors, asking if they seen anybody or anything suspicious him being a law-abiding citizen, he said, yeah, I think my daughter knows something. I think she knows something. And this is how everything started to unravel. Um, one of my co we had all gotten away, so to speak. One of my co-defendants um, was from the Bay Area. 
So he kept trying to call a cab at two, three in the morning. It was about three in the morning now. And so by this time, the detectives are in the cab because this guy called a cab, went to a, a motel, paid cash, got spooked, went to another motel, paid cash, called a cab, said, hey, I want, you, want a cab to take me to the bay. The cab driver tell him, okay, I guess it, I don't, allegedly told him it was about $200. And he was like, okay, I could pay that. I could pay that in cash. So that made the police suspicious. So the police ended up pulling up in the cab, posing as the taxi driver, asking him what was going on, kept asking him questions. And then he allegedly just began to tell what happened from the beginning to the end. This is how my co-defendants was implicated. This is how I was implicated. And this is how we all ended up doing life in prison. I ended up getting a 25 year to life sentence and I ended up doing 26 years and eight months. So during that time, it was hectic. You know, I, I learned to, um, I learned to, to be quiet. That's, that's why I learned to be quiet. I learned to be quiet and watch because, you know, walking on to, walking into San Quentin was, 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 was weird. It was weird, crazy because you see men who look like women and then you see men, I saw men with legs, with, with arms as, as big as my leg, like my thigh leg. My th I'm like, these dudes are so big, monsters are huge. So again, that, that fear, but that fear also was like, man, I ain't going out. I ain't going out, you know, I'm not going out. So I learned to be quiet and watch. I learned to do what everybody else is learning to do, how to make a knife, where to hide it, what, how to move, how to watch your back, how to see what's going on, how to be able to recognize some stuff from afar before it came to me or how to maneuver around it. I learned so many different things that kept me safe in prison. I was never a victim. I was never ran off a yard. I was never stabbed. I was never disciplined. There's guys who come into prison and first week, two weeks discipline, tattoos, uh, rolling up off of the yard, taking psych meds, like to me, that was all different ways of escaping. But I was like, I'm here now, so none of that mattered to me. I was just trying to figure out what it is I needed to do because even though I had life in prison, I never felt like I was gonna die in prison. I never felt like not one time that I felt like I was gonna die in prison in my mind. But looking back during the instances when there were race riots, where there was just things just going on on the yard between different races, gang, fights and you know when those bullets get to whizzing hey, that, that's that's something completely different you know you hear that that loud shotgun that not the shotgun the the um big bertha with what we used to call her and uh that's the one with the black gun you hear that that's enough to shake you for a minute but then after a while you get used to hearing that like oh that ain't nothing get used to seeing people getting stabbed like damn why they stab him like that they should have stabbed him over there by the bathroom and they should have broke that piece off into him and like oh look uh, they got him, oh, he pissed, and you can see just piss just running out the gurney, like, oh, like really becoming cold, like, it's, but that was necessary to survive. I had to feel that, I had to not feel, I had to be cold, because to feel something would make me vulnerable, you understand what I'm saying? And, and then survival, you know, to survive and then to adopt, you know? It's either you gonna hunt or you gonna be the haunted. And, and that's just the way it is in there. I've seen so many things, and, and not just on the, on, the, on the side of the prisoners, I, I've seen the police do crooked, shady things. You know, I've seen dudes, you know, trying to get out of their cells because they're not getting along with their cellmate, and then the police cuffing them up, dragging them up the stairs, graded stairs, high desert state prison, dragging them up the stairs, throwing them into a cell, telling them, what you gonna do? Cause I'm about to go home. You wanna sleep with them cuffs on? You want me to take them off? What you gonna do? Better take them cuffs off. Some crazy things I done seen happen. I done been in the shoes where, you know, the police would come by, cork and shoe, 93, 94. Police come by, just, they don't like you, or if they just trying to get you to go somewhere mentally, they'll take your food. They'll just throw your tray inside, slam the, slam the tray slot closed. What you gonna do, eat that off the floor? Vicious. Canteen, they don't bring you a canteen. When they did, they put it in brown bags, everything. Bust open the chips, brown bag. Soups, brown bag. Cookies, brown bag, you know? So I had to learn, man. I had to learn how to survive, you know? I had to learn how to save my lunch. 
Take the bread, wet the towel, wrap it around the wet towel, fold it up. That's going to keep the bread soft. Because if I don't do that, it's going to get hard in a brown bag, in a wax bag, you know, the little white sandwich bags. But uh, learning, man, being in prison, man, I, I saw so many different things. But the things that I saw are also the things that changed me. Because to me, I'm like, why would I want that? I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't. I'm not insane, right? My, I have all my mental bearings. I'm a little emotionally shook because of, you know, my upbringing and things that I've been through. Uh, but as far as, as far as, uh, I believe as far as anything else, man, it's like prison, once you have a certain understanding, a certain maturity about yourself, like you understand that prison is really for losers. You know, you go for the first time, you figure it out. Um, it's unfortunate I had to spend so much time in prison to figure it out. But if I had only done like five or six years, even if I would have done 10 years, honestly, I would have came out the same person. Does, does, does prison um, rehabilitate anyone? <laughs> Say what? <laughs> That's funny. You said, does prison rehabilitate? Absolutely not. It takes an individual to, in, to, to rehabilitate themselves. Prison don't do nothing. Prison don't do nothing but house you. That's it. That's all prison does. And you come out institutionalized? Some do. Some do. I thought for a while, because I was so used to getting into a shower, washing my boxers, washing my socks, then washing myself up, that I thought, because I heard so many other people say that those are the things that they did when they got out of prison. For me, that wasn't my issue. I, that, that was not my issue. For me, my issue was... Walking into, as if I'm walking into a prison for the first time. I, I've been to so many different prisons. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, and that's because a lot of the yards that I went to, they were either transitioning. Like a lot of yards that I was on was, was transitioning, like Mill Creek, Corcoran. Those yards was transitioning from GP yards to SNY yards. So I, I was on some of those yards for like 45 days on another bus, on to somewhere else. But... Uh, the point that I was making is is that the rehabilitation comes from self. Like the the what I had to learn to deal with was uh, assessing people, recognizing a threat, a possible threat. It's like walking in the on the yard and for the first time, you know, clear, go to the yard. You don't know who's there. You don't know what's what. So you look and you assess people. So when I got out, I remember going to a Friday's. Um, with my ex-wife, and and, I'm, and I, I noticed these two gentlemen who, you know, I could tell they were street, and, and they was just looking at me. They had this look, and it could have been, yeah, because I'm fresh out of prison, I know I have a different aura, a different look, a different vibe, but that drew caution to me, you know? And I remember telling my girl, like, I don't know what these guys is on, but uh, I, I'm going to have to get one of them things. She was like, what? What one of my things? I was being funny because I, I don't want to go back to jail. So I didn't really want one of those things. But I was just trying to tell her in a way that I was a little bothered by what was going on. And her reaction was completely not what I thought it was. Her reaction was more like, ain't nobody worried about you. You need to stop tripping. And that was only that was only one incident of several others. I remember uh, going shopping at the outlet in uh, San Diego. We went to the Nike outlet and it was there was, you know, it was crowded. But it was a guy who walked past me and just bumped me like, bumped me enough to where I turned a little bit. So I stopped. I, I, I completely just stopped in my tracks. And I was processing, like, to myself, self-talk, very valuable, very important. Because what we tell ourselves is going to determine how we feel, how we think, and what we will do. So I was telling myself, oh, that ain't nothing. That ain't nothing. Just take a deep breath. That ain't nothing. He don't know. Because if he knew, he wouldn't have bumped me like that. He would have walked around me. But the good thing is he don't know, which means he don't see the glass around my feet, the broken glass. He don't know where I came from. So that was a testament to my change. But then in the same instance, my ex-wife came up to me and was like, why are you looking like that? Straighten your face. And, and so to be in a relationship with someone that you're around constantly and for them not to understand what I, a person that's incarcerated has been through for so many years, if they don't understand, like they, they, can, they can cause some harm. They can cause some, some mental and emotional harm.
you know? And that's the reason why she is my ex now, because she couldn't deal with the things that I was going through. And I still have challenges. I still find challenges. You know, my biggest thing right now is road rage. I used to pray like, you know, God, let me out. I promise I'm going to obey all the rules. And man, I drive, I drive, I speed, you know, because I don't like people slowing me down, getting in my way. I'm a defensive driver. But uh, road rage is my biggest thing. That's my biggest problem right now. What's your, what's your biggest regret? My biggest regret? <laughs> I'm glad you asked me that because my biggest regret was uh, not preventing, not preventing the crime that I was involved in. And because if I had prevented it, I, I would have saved this man's life. And, and that's kind of why I said earlier, like this guy is, was my hero because I didn't have a father. So, so you, you, know? you, you, you got convicted of murder like everybody else? I absolutely did. Got convicted of murder, 25 years of life. And that was not your intent? Sorry? That was not your intention when you got to, into this. No, absolutely not. My intention was just to be the lookout, get get that 15 bands. That, that was it. Mm -hmm. Wasn't nobody supposed to be there. So, again, this guy be, became my hero because he was a father who provided for his family. He's a father who died for his family. And I'm like, man, that that to me, that's what a man is supposed to do. That's what a father is supposed to do. You know? So that's kind of what puts me on the, 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 the track that I'm on mentally, even when I being confronted or feel like something is going on, something's wrong, you know, I, I just stop and I just think like, you know, why would I do that? I don't want to put myself back in the situation. I want to be that man. I want to be that father. I want to be here for my children. You know, when I get married again, I want to be here for my wife. I want to be a provider. I want to be a protector, you know, and I want to add value. I want to add value to this world. You know, if I can't do that, then how will anybody ever know I was here? And uh, now that you're out, what, what, what are your plans? What, what's your biggest fear now? Whew. My biggest fear, um, my biggest fear is, is, is not being able to create financial sources to sustain myself to, you know, I want to get to a point to where I'm making money when I'm asleep because there's no retirement plan for me. You know, I, I'm, I'm surpassed that. So, you know, I, I wrote a book while I was in there uh, called On GP. I wrote a book while I was in prison. Everybody used to talk about Donald Goins and all these different authors and true to the game and all this. Stuff. I was like, man, if I read one of those, I might as well write a book. So that's what I did. I, I wrote a book. You know, uh, I do music. I still do my music. I write. Um, I dropped a couple of songs. Um, let me see. I shot my first video two years ago. I just dropped a couple of songs last month. And I got a new release, a new single coming out on, on the 5th, Cinco de Mayo. So Emo hopefully, Emotionally, what did you go through when you were in prison? Sorry? Emotionally, what were you going through? Emotionally. Because I'm sure you felt like, how did I get into this? You know... Yeah, absolutely. Like, for a long time, I wondered if it was real. <laughs> like, all right, somebody playing a joke on me. Like, no, seriously, somebody playing a joke on me. It's going to all be over. They're going to come and pop the door and be like, hey, come here, it's over. We just had you on the experiment, wanted to see how you were going to take it. And it's like a bad dream. A bad dream. That's exactly what I thought it was. And like I said, um, you know, being in prison for so long and, uh, being detached, I lost my mom uh, in 2005 and my mom was my backbone. She was my main source of support. She was always there for me, um, visits. Even when I told her not to come, she'd come anyway, you know? Um, she started to get ill, you know, um, uh, dialysis, kidney failure. And um, yeah, so when my mom passed, it was like I was alone. Like nobody, I can't, there was nobody I can call on to just, Hey, I need $100 to save my life. I couldn't count on nobody. Couldn't count on nobody. Didn't have, wasn't in contact with my father. Um, so emotionally, I felt like, I felt like I didn't have nobody but myself. So I was up against it. It was like a, a good day, a bad day, a good day, a bad day. And that's why I was so bitter for a long time while I was in prison. Because I felt like everything that was going on around me was everybody else's fault. You know, I felt like I ain't the one who pulled the trigger. So why am I doing all these years in jail? You're not a killer. I'm not, but I'm responsible. Yeah. 
You understand what I'm saying? You just got involved in some. I'm responsible because I could have prevented it. Mm. So, yeah, so I, I got to eat that like everybody else had to eat it. You know, I have to take it for what it is. So I remember, um, and another part of the the whole emotional thing, right? It's like, like I was saying, it's like my mom was my biggest supporter. So, you know, after not having any contact with anyone, it's like sitting in the cell waiting, waiting for count to clear just so I can get some dinner and maybe get a phone call or some day room. So during the count time, you know, either right before or right after, usually the COs, are, they'll, they'll come around, you hear the doors, boom, boom, 180, you hear the doors, boom, boom. You can hear him, he's in A section. You hear the, you can hear the keys, ting, ting, sounds like, sound like jingle bells, you can hear the keys. And then boom, boom, Carson section, that's C section, that's the section I'm in. You know, just to, just remembering, like hearing those keys and hearing them call names. I'm like, oh, I want some. I, even though I don't know nobody in the world that's gonna write me, who's gonna write me? Every now and then you get that letter, and it's like Christmas. It's like, man, you bust that thing open. First thing you should do though is look on the back and see if it was a stamp. I don't know how they do it now. I've been out five years, but they used to put this stamp on the back. And you can just get it and feel it and tell if there's some pictures in there. If you didn't feel no pictures, you look at the back and be like, man, I want some money on there. Did somebody send me some money? You know, because you start to feel like the world is surreal. Like, you start to feel, I started to feel like the only thing that existed was me in that prison, in that world of chaos. Un disorganized chaos. Because that's how the police ran it. Disorganized chaos. You know, a bunch of fake politics, a bunch of fake everything, things that... Man, I'm from Seaside, California, man. I, I grew up around everybody, you know? And then you get into an environment where people telling you they can't talk to you, they can't sit with you, they can't play cards with you, they can't eat with you, they can't accept nothing from you if it's not uh, sealed, if it's not brand new. It's like, wow, really? It's crazy. What, what do you think the solution is for guys in your situation that, that grew up in maybe a tough neighborhood, didn't have their dad in their life? What, I mean, is there a solution in your mind? Honestly, there is. Or something that can help? The, absolutely there is. So about, I believe it was about 2012, a guy told me, hey man, you should read a book. I was like, what's the name of the book? He said, oh, it's called uh, A Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Franco. So I read that book and that, that book was deep, you know? Um, in that book, it was a guy who ended up going to uh, the Jewish camp. I, I believe it was Auschwitz or something like that. But anyway, he ended up going to one of those one of those camps, and um, he had lost his wife. And he said, in order, he was saying that in order for him to um, deal with losing his wife is by understanding that he would rather suffer that pain than for him to die and know that she would suffer that pain from losing him. I was like, that's deep. So I started to begin to learn about perception, perspective, you know, looking outside of the box. And to me, that's what actually looking outside of the box is, is being able to broaden your perception, right? To take your perception and to take everybody else's perception in the room. That makes you the most valuable yet the most dangerous person in the room because you can understand from everybody's angle. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that book was a good book. The next book was um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I probably read maybe half of that book before the guy that let me read the book was going home and he took the book with him. And I was a little upset. I was like, you're going home, what you need the book for? But when I read the book, looking at the stories that changed the perception, for instance, the guy, he, he was driving a car, just to give a brief example about perception, he was driving a car, nice little red Corvette, let's say. And he see this kid. This kid is just throwing rocks at these cars as they go by. So he tells himself, he said, I'm going to go slow. And if this little kid throws a rock at my car, I'm going to get out and I'm going to whoop his ass. Right? So he goes slow. He doesn't stop. The kid doesn't do nothing. The kid is just looking. The kid got his hands up. He keeps driving by. The kid picks up a rock. Boom. Throws it at his car. Boom. Puts a dent in the side of his car. He gets out, looks, he sees a dent. He said, hey, what's the wrong with you? What the hell's wrong with you? So before he could finish chastising the kid, the kid throws his hands up. He says, I'm sorry, mister. I'm sorry, but I've been out here for hours and my, my brother's in a wheelchair. He fell over in the ditch and he's too heavy for me to pick him up. So the man never changed the dent, never fixed the dent in his door. 
because you always wanted to be reminded of perception that sometimes it's not what we see. Sometimes we just have to stop and ask and see it from somebody else's point of view. And that was just one of them. So that is what started to change my life, perception. I started to see things the way that other people saw them and not just the way I thought they were. You know, I used to kick cellies out just for snoring. I used to kick cellies out if their blanket was hanging down the front of the bed or the back of the bed. I used to kick them out myself. I used to kick them out. I mean, hey, you got to go, fam. This is, this is what it is. You got to get up out of here. I had some good cellies, you know, but again, it was the perception that changed my life. So if someone wanted to change and when we spoke about rehabilitation, you asked me, does prison rehabilitate? Prison does not rehabilitate. I don't care how many programs they offer, how much this or that they offer, it does not. It's the individual. It takes the individual to rehabilitate themselves. And the best thing that I could ever advise someone to do, especially if you're a lifer and you're going to the board, think about it like this. When you go into that boardroom, they're not going to ask you questions that you don't already know. I went into the boardroom and I seen so many um I think there were 114 D's, confidential kites. Like, I seen so many. I was like, they knew about stuff that I was like, what the hell? Crazy. But yeah, there's always an inside man. It's, that's just the way it is. So you got to leave the, leave the crap alone. Leave all that crap alone. Be you, because if you're going to get into some drama, you're going to get into some drama whether you're riding by yourself or whether you're riding with 100 other people. So be yourself. Do your thing. Do your time. And, and, and think about perception. So when you go into that boardroom, what they want to hear is you doing an autopsy on your body, on the old person that you were. And if you can cut that body open and talk about the things that you did growing up, the things that happened to you, you know, when you're talking about lifestyle factors, life history factors, those are the things that they're talking about. You know, what are the things that happened to you at, at a young age that you could not change? And what are the things that you chose to do when you started to get older that you decided to do on your own? And then be able to understand why you did them, you know? Hurt people hurt people. That's why I committed to crime I committed, because I didn't care about how nobody else was feeling. Somebody stole my bike, I'm going to steal some bikes, you know? I don't have no money to get it. Ain't nobody trying to give it to me, so I'm going to go steal it. I'm going to go take it, you know? All just false life, false image, false pride, looking at people like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to emulate that. That's what I'm going to be. I was a thousand different people, man. I was a thousand different people. And then I decided like one day, like, man, you know, with the perception that I learned and then I gained, it's like, man, what was it worth? You know, my mom died while I was in prison. I didn't get to go to her funeral. You know, I lost a little brother, two nephews while I was in prison. I didn't get to go to their funeral. You know, it is what it is. When is it going to stop? It's going to stop now. What do, you, what do you think the most important thing you've learned in all of this? The most important thing that I learned in all of this is that material things mean absolutely nothing. It's the memories that we make are the things that are going to sustain us when we take off our own breath, in my opinion. Hmm. All right. Eugene. Yes. Very interesting talk. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Wish you lots of luck now that you're out. I appreciate you. And y'all can check me out at Why Be Loyal. Check me out. Check out my music. I'm dropping a new CD, a new single called Pain on Cinco de Mayo, 5-5-2023. All right, man. Thank you very much. Yes, sir.